Good afternoon. This is Marta Okonievsky, Director of Student Engagement at the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, also known as AACN. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is hosted by Jonas Nursing and Veterans Healthcare in partnership with AACN. Specifically, today's webinar is offered through the Jonas Alumni Council. Before we get started, please review the disclosures on your screen. I want to go over a couple of things before we begin. First, you can access the PowerPoint slides as a handout by saving them through the file transfer function. If you didn't have a chance to access the PowerPoint slides at the beginning, we will email them out as a handout after the presentation ends with a link to the evaluation. If you have a question, please type it in the chat area on your screen. Content-specific questions will be answered following the slide presentation as time allows. This session will be recorded and it will be available through your My, or it will be actually available through the Jonas website. Um, we will also make sure to provide a link to where the recording will be housed in the follow-up email. At the end of the session, you will be directed to a program evaluation and as I mentioned before, we'll also send you an email with that evaluation link. Check your junk mail if you do not receive it. In addition, you're able to earn one continuing education contact hour for attending today's webinar. If you would like to receive credit, you must complete the evaluation. At the end of the evaluation, you will be able to access a certificate. We appreciate your feedback. While you cannot see the other attendees' names, you are not alone. Attendees are not able to view the entire attendee list. So with that quick introduction, I would like to introduce our webinar today, which is titled Mobilizing Your Research Beyond Publication. We're thrilled to have our speaker today joining us, who's Michelle Lichman, who is a digital health and diabetes re researcher at the University of Utah College of Nursing. She maintains an active clinical practice as an endocrinology nurse practitioner at the Utah Diabetes and Endocrinology Center. She is a Jonas Scholar from the 2010-2012 cohort, Vice President of Clinical and Translational Scholars, and Fellow of the American Association of Nurse Practitioners. Her research is focused on the social context of chronic disease management across the lifespan as it relates to online and family environments. Her research has been highlighted on NPR Science Friday, Medscape, and U.S. World News Reports. So with that, I now would like to turn it over to our speaker. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marta. I'm really excited to be here. And I think one of the reasons why it's so important to mobilize research beyond publication is we need to make sure that our work gets out there. We know that it takes so long, it takes up to 17 years for evidence to really come into practice. And so we need to make sure that we're doing our best to make sure that, that, is, that our research results in timely implementation in the clinical space. So I wanna start by talking about typically how things start with, with anyone who is in research. So first of all, we get an idea and then we, put that idea and movement into grant writing, and hopefully that is funded and we do some research. And then we write up our results and we publish those. And then our next goal is that we hope people read what we've written, that they cite what we've written, and that that impacts care and really uh, patients, families, and communities in, how, in their health. And so today I'm going to be talking specifically about the reading and the citation piece of it. So let's talk about research impact. In order to have anybody read or cite, we know that that ties into research impact. And research impact is measured in a couple of different ways. So many of you guys know that citations is a big part of that. Well, citations is the end goal of, a, of precursors, and those precursors include usage. So a lot of us don't realize that you can actually look online when you've published something and look at how many downloads or how many views have been on your publication. And another metric is actually something called alt metrics. And this is where there's information about the conversation that is happening around your article in online and news stories. 
Let's talk a little bit more about the alt metrics. So you may have seen uh, the color of a donut and you can see the colors that represent different um, components here. So you can see that news is dark red and turquoise is Twitter and, uh, and, um, and you can see that Reddit and Pinterest and all of these other social media pieces are there as well. Well, those alt metrics are all tied into these conversations that I just spoke about. And so it's really important to um, really identify those alt metrics. And I'm going to show you some examples in just a minute if you're not familiar with alt metrics actually means with regards to your publication. But I want you guys to know that alt metrics is a lot of it is Twitter based. So even though there's all of those different colors that make up the altmetrics donut, most of them are that blue turquoise color that is Twitter. And so if you want to get the most bang for your buck, using Twitter to share your great studies is really the place to be. Let me show you some results um, from some different studies. So there's a great study by Gunther Eisenbach discussing the idea of tweetations, which is essentially putting your research out there on Twitter and how that leads to citations 14.2 times. And so this has actually been replicated in other studies. Um, you can see here that, you know, we know that Twitter is 14.2, but if you look at Facebook and Mendeley, it does increase the readership. So Facebook and, and, and Mendeley uh, about one time. But really, the biggest thing for your buck, again, here is Twitter. And there's a, a study that was done in urology and where they had different people sharing or not sharing their research on Twitter. And those who shared had an increased citation on Scopus and Google Scholar. So again, Twitter is a really great place to share your research. So let's talk about how someone might do that. Let's talk about social media for a little bit. And I'm not going to duplicate another Jonas webinar that Christy Lesbaum did recently on how to use social media. Really what my presentation here is going to talk about is kind of the social media piece in action and then how you can look at your own articles to really see what, what the impact is. So let's take one of my articles, for example. So this is a screen grab from the Journal of Diabetes Science and Technology. You can see the title, and you can see, um, you know, it looks like an average website where you would might see a publication. Well, here where this orange arrow is, there's a little tiny box called Altmetrics, and this is what I've been talking about when I talked about the circle of the donut. So if you click on that button, um, you can actually see some information about um, what, uh, how news and, and blogs and tweets are actually impacting your research. And I want to tell you a little bit about how you can get there. So one of the things that I typically do is when I publish, I like to do a tweet thread about my research. So this is an example. So this is the same study, and this is a tweet. So our study, State of the Science, the scoping group gap analysis of the online communities is out. There's a short link of it, and this thread will discuss the highlights. And so you can see that I've added a few hashtags as well. And then I actually created a thread so you can see that there was number one and now this is number two. This gives an example of the, the articles that were screened, how many countries were involved, the types of participants that were in this review, um, how it tied into A1C level, how healthcare providers were involved with people in their online community use. And you can see that the list goes on and on and on. Well, one of the things that can happen with these threads is anytime someone picks up one of the tweets, they can actually go and they're connected to see all of the other tweets. And I think one of the most important things is to really give credit or kudos to the people that were part of your team. So my last tweet in this thread was shout out to this fantastic research team of inter interdisciplinary clinicians, people with diabetes, and parents of children with diabetes who collaborated, and then I included their names. It's really important as you think about your collaborators, if they're on Twitter too, it just increases the visibility of your work because if they're sharing the information, you're increasing not just to your followers, but also their followers as well. So let's take another look at this screen grab. So you can see that this orange arrow on the left-hand side is pointing to something called article metrics. So these article metrics is where you can actually see these total views and downloads. You can see 
this article, it was published in December, and since December, it's been viewed or downloaded 326 times. You can also see the color of the donut below. You can see that the Altmetric score is 338, and that this was picked up on Twitter and news, and also in the blog space. One of the things that I think can also help increase this notion of are people actually seeing my article is something called a visual abstract. So a visual abstract is a visual representation of your research findings. And we're seeing a lot more of this, especially in the light of COVID, because a lot of us are now getting on Twitter and sharing our highlights. Um, but these visual abstracts have been around for, for several years. You can see that um, an early study was done in April 2017 about how visual abstracts can actually increase dissemination of your work. So it increases impressions, it increases retweets and article visits. And this was specifically to the Annals of Surgery journal. So what it essentially is, is a graphic of your results. And so a lot of us like to get into the nitty gritty of the background and the methods but really, when you do a visual abstract for social media, it's really the hook, and the hook is oftentimes the result. And so really, it's just making sure that your results are interesting enough that people will want to click on the link to visit your study. So here's an example of one of mine. So you can see up top that over half of people with diabetes reported engaging in underground exchange activity and how distress predicted engagement in trading, receiving donations or medication supplies. And this is specifically about the underground insulin exchange. And then qualitative people could see that on the, the right-hand side, how I mapped out different themes. Well, one way to create something like this is to actually use PowerPoint. So if you, on the right-hand side, you can see that arrow where it talks about slide size. If you use if you change your slide size to 10.66 inches by 5.3 inches, it's the perfect size for Twitter. And then you can create your image or your graphic inside Twitter, or excuse me, inside PowerPoint to be optimized for Twitter. You know, Twitter is interesting because it, it really is important to create that rectangular shape because you know, Instagram is a square and Facebook is really kind of shape agnostic, but if you don't have the rectangle, then it makes the user have to click one extra time in order to see your full view of your picture. And really you wanna make things easy for them and you want be, someone to be able to see and understand your, your research right at the get-go. So one way that you could talk about this on social media is, um, one of my tweets said, our latest work in JDST explores the underground exchange of diabetes medications and supplies. And I talked about the co-authors. And really, you can see here, I've used a hashtag. Um, I know that diabetes is a strong hashtag in my research space. I've also included co-authors and had a sharing plan. So when I posted this, my co-authors knew in advance that this was going to go up and that there was an expectation that they also shared it, they liked it, retweeted, and also created their own social media post to increase visibility. And then the next thing you wanna do is, is create a shortened article to your link. And so you can do this with Bitly very easily. You just essentially um, pull in your full web link into the Bitly and it will shorten it with the click of a button. The importance of a shortened link is because Twitter only allows uh, so many characters, and you want to make sure that those characters are made to good use, really describing what it is you're showing them. Here's another example of a visual abstract. You can see that the style is completely different. It looks kind of like post-it notes, and you can see that there's these five post-it notes that really kind of highlight what the results are, what the findings are. You can see the sample size of the baby boomers versus the younger adults, and you know how many people found the, the online community as helpful or, or harmful. And so really what you're trying to do is visually try to hook somebody so that they think, oh my gosh, let me stop scrolling so that I can actually see what this is. And once they see it, it, see it hopefully you've gauged their interest enough that they then click your link. And I know a lot of us didn't go to design school to try and figure out how to create these visually appealing uh, visual graphics. But one thing that some people um, can do is they can create templates. So the University of Utah College of Nursing has 
created a template that some of the faculty use, some don't, but here's one thing that your university could do, or you could create one for yourself so that it's you know, kind of blocked off into those three sections, similar to the yellow one that I showed you a few slides ago. Um, this is from one of my colleagues who examined a, a high-profile nurse arrest. And so you can grab these graphics a lot of times on Google Image if you're looking for free images. Also, PowerPoint has images, um, and Lucid Press and Canva also have some in images as well. And so really trying to figure out, well, how can I summarize my research findings in a graphic? Um, can be really, really important because it really shows um, exactly what it, it helps to promote the story that you're trying to tell. So I want to talk a little bit about videos. We know that videos are huge now. Uh, the majority, the, the largest social media site is, is, is now YouTube. And so videos are really important. And when we can embed a video about what it is what story we're trying to tell about our research, it can actually really provide something powerful. So more recently, a lot of people have been starting to create these videos for these conference abstracts because of COVID-19. And I think that that's really, really important because it gives a voice to you and your research, but also in an intriguing way. So you could see that the, the tweet threads, um, how they can provide a lot of information but a video of you talking or a video of a GIF um, can also be really, really important as well. And I'm going to show you an example of how you could create a video quite easily. So this is uh, from the University of Utah Twitter handle. And this was a, a video that I created um, really kind of looking at nurses from the lens of children. And we collected a lot of photos that were drawn by different children, and we put them into this video. And if you're interested, you should go check out their website because the, the video, I think, turned out really, really great. But what is the how-to? How would you create something like this? Well, what you would do is you would create every little transition in your PowerPoint. Anytime you want a change of animation, you create a new slide. So you can see over here on the left-hand side, that there's a lot of different um, slides, you know, and you can see that there's different pictures that the different children had created. But once you have all of the different slides in place for every single transition, you export the file, and then you create, you change the file format. So instead of being a PowerPoint, you change it to be an animated GIF. And then you can change the image quality based on your needs. And then you can determine how many seconds you want someone to land on, how, how often you want it to transition. So if you go too fast, someone might not be able to read the content. So you have to determine, is this a photograph I'm trying to show, or is this something I actually intend for someone to read? And then that can determine how long, the, how long you want the slides to transition. I think another point is, you know, as people are scrolling through social media, if it doesn't transition fast enough, someone might not realize that it's a video. And so typically what I have done is two seconds, but I've, I think it really just depends on your needs. So we talked just a second about Twitter posters, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples of, with some screen grabs of what one of the students um, that I've been working with has done. So you can see that there's a student, she posted on Twitter information about her study, and this is actually a GIF. So I'm going to show you three slides of the GIF. So you can see that the first slide really kind of gives that background information. So this is on new parents' health loneliness, and really there's a great image, and the text is brief. And she, you can see that she's also used different hashtags to try and connect with different audiences. The next thing that she shows is uh, she, she really pulled together a scoping review for this. And so you can see uh, some of the different tags. Um, you can see the presenter information inside the magnifying glass. So she's using imagery to really kind of grasp someone's interest. And then she's using uh, bolded words to really try and make sure to direct the, the attention, just like you would in a grant. When you're writing a grant, you might bold or underline certain words to really draw your attention. And then in the final 
um, slide of the GIF, and you can actually see some of the different results that she shared. And so there's definitely uh, great ways to show your your information, especially if you're if you're all now entering in the stage of having to present online. Doing something like this, or a you can even even do a voiceover PowerPoint. Um, the I think the the main thing about sharing something on social media is typically in a, when someone is scrolling on Twitter, you typically want to keep things to be less than a minute because people um, are sitting down and maybe not necessarily intending to watch a full 60 minute presentation. And so um, obviously look at what the guidelines of the different conference recommendations are, but this is one way that you can share information about your research um, to make sure that it's getting out there. And again, I think that we spend so much time writing, processing our ideas, writing a grant, conducting the research, finally getting it published after potentially revisions. And then if it doesn't get disseminated, it sits there. And when I thought about that, I just couldn't fathom the idea of working so hard on something and then nobody seeing it. And so this is really why I feel it's important to make sure that our work gets disseminated. Um, it's important that our work, our, all of our hard work, our blood, blood sweat, and tears really um, comes to fruition so that we can actually make an impact. So a lot of people ask me, well, I'm not on Twitter. What should I do? Um, because we know that Altmetrics, the majority of it is really, really based on someone being on Twitter. Well, I have a couple of things that I'd like to share about that. So there are five different ways that I think people are using Twitter. So some people are just consuming it. Um, they're not, they're reading, um, but they're really not um, doing very much more. They're kind of, in a sense, lurking, um, for lack of a better word. And then there's the people who are really creating a lot of information. They're creating infographics. They're um, they're creating new posts. And then you've got someone who's really curating. So curating is this idea of sharing other people's work and trying to make sure that, um, that they're maybe curating content over a specific area. And then you've got people who really amplify. So these are the people who really like and retweet and really boost somebody up. Um, amplifiers are great if they're, especially people who are in leadership who can really amplify the work of the students or the junior faculty that they're working with. And then there's something um, that some people call as Twitter method fasting, which is this idea that people come on Twitter, maybe just for conferences or maybe just for certain things, and then they take a break and they're not on it all the time. And that's okay too. I think that it's important to really kind of identify where you can participate um, in Twitter. But just know that if you're not on all the time, it's okay, but it is important, I think, for dissemination purposes that at least an effort is made. So in addition to Twitter, I think it's really important to make sure that people are making their Google Scholar profiles and also updating them. One of the things that happens is a lot of people will make sure that everything is updated in PubMed, but for those of you who might cross over into psychology or into computer science, if your publications don't make it to PubMed, someone who's looking you up in PubMed might not actually see your full body of work. And so for me, because I do a lot of internet-based stuff, some of my things are not actually um, indexed in PubMed. And so one of the things that I do is I make sure to keep my Google Scholar profile updated. So what, one of the things that you can do is, um, if, you, if you don't remember if you've made one or not, you can just uh, go to Google Scholar, which is scholar.google.com, and put in your name. And then if there's something there, you'll see a profile. And if there's not, you can actually create a profile. Well, when I click on my profile, I can see that there's a picture of me and I've been linked to the University of Utah College of Nursing and I can put in keywords that are tied to my work. And then you can see that uh, a list of my, my articles are there and then you can see your citations and your H index. One of the things that happens is 
some of all of your uh, published abstracts also come over through Google Scholar. So it's a really nice way to not only have a nice collection of everything that you've done in addition to PubMed, but also um, you can link to other people as well. So you could actually follow other people's work and any time that it gets um, indexed in Google Scholar, you can be alerted of somebody else's work that you may not know of. And so I think that this is a really nice tool. It's a really easy tool because um, it actually kind of self-updates. I think one of the challenges is if you have a common name or, or at least somebody else has your name. So uh, there's another person with my name, Michelle Lichman, and they're in chemistry. And so I have to make sure that none of her work is getting put on my profile because that belongs to this other person. And so just making sure that you're checking in on it every once in a while, but really um, it, it hasn't taken me very much effort um, beyond the initial setup. It really just starts to auto-populate after I've set it up. So now I want to spend a little bit of time about, you know, really how can you impact care in patients, families, and communities. And, I want to spend um, a little bit of time talking about how press releases can really help do that. So for those of you who don't know, a press release is information that is shared with news outlets about different things. Uh, in this case, I'm talking about research. Press releases are really, really important because when a news media outlet picks up your research, it can actually carry that research quite further, and it allows you to have greater impact in some instances. I've been pretty fortunate in that I've been able to leverage um, several press release releases throughout my career, um, both through the University of Utah, but also through professional organizations. So in some cases, a professional organization, when they have a conference, they'll pick uh, some of the top research that they want highlighted, and then they'll generate a press release around that. So I've had both through my university, but also through conference presentations. So through those press releases, I've been able to be on NPR Science Friday. I was on there last December talking about this underground exchange of diabetes medications and supplies. And then once I was on NPR Science Friday, other people wanted to interact with me as well. And so then um, the local Utah NPR wanted to talk with me, Undisciplined Podcast and BYU Radio. And so then I started to not only get these podcast interviews, but I was also able to be interviewed on, in the media by lots of different individuals, including uh, Medscape and U.S. World News Reports. And so I think if you can get that initial press release, it can actually take you pretty far with regards to getting that support. And then one thing that I did was I leveraged that media attention. So I... Um, I created a handout, and it looks like this slide got a little bit funky, but the top middle um, is, a, is a handout that I created for legislators. And I actually met with a House of Represent uh, Representative in my state, and I was able to co-write some of the bill and really make some recommendations related to insulin access. And I'm proud to say that, the, that it passed um, very recently, signed by the governor a few weeks ago. And so now we have the strongest insulin access legislation in the United States where it's capped at $30 per vial. And also there's some really great um, scope of practice uh, um, changes with pharmacists who can actually prescribe insulin in emergency situations. And so really, you know, having research that is in the media that, that your local newspapers are starting to pick up, legislators are really interested in that because it's a hot topic, and so you can then leverage that. One of the things that really happened for me is, you know, I didn't just meet this representative. Uh, I had interactions with my Utah nurse practitioner um, and my AANP um, leadership, and they both knew you know, on the state level and um, at the regional level, two people in my state knew exactly what I was doing. And so when they were meeting with this representative about general nurse practitioner issues, um, they brought my name up and then he reached out to me. And so I think that making sure that people who are interacting with legislators on a regular basis know about your work 
and are willing to kind of sponsor your name forward is also really, really important. And then when something passes, really sharing that great news for the lay audience. So you can see here, the Utah Senate unanimously voted to pass HB 207 in Utah today. And then what I did was, because bills can be full of jargon and a lot of people don't necessarily um, spend the time reading all of it, and I wanted to make sure it went beyond the headlines. And so I talked about what that bill actually meant. So this was, you know, if you were privately insured, what does that mean for you? If you're uninsured or self-insured, what, what does that law mean for you? And so you can see how I broke down that bill into a couple of different tweets that were easy to read um, and then provided um, the information in bite sizes so that somebody could really understand what that bill meant. So that's part of science communication is really trying to take complex things and then break it down. And then finally, um, this was just released last week, I was interviewed for CNN. They have a show called CNN Go There, and uh, it was specifically to the cost of insulin and the research that I've been talking about, about how people have traded or, um, you know, traded or donated insulin. And so this was um, something that happened just, that went live last week. And so again, leveraging all of your media um, opportunities, so there's Twitter, there is press releases, and then you can maybe do podcasts and then getting yourself out there on CNN. And then one other thing that I like to talk about, because you know I've talked a lot about uh, self-promotion in some regard, but I also wanna make sure that you can understand the value of promoting others through live tweeting. So live tweeting is actually when you attend a session, you can actually open up your laptop or get on your phone and actually tweet some of the poignant items that are being said by someone. And that really elevates them as being an expert in their field. And it also um, shares research with others. Not everybody can attend conferences, um, but when you tweet, that allows other people to actually get this great information, these really, um, you know, these pearls of wisdom that are being shared at conferences. And so you can see how I've done this in a thread. So uh, M. Hill 226, who is Marissa Hilliard, she's a great psychologist in Texas. And she came and spoke to our group about type 1 diabetes and resilience. And so you can see about how um, you can actually just create these threads about these really, really important things that are being said. And then um, you can see down here in the bottom right, in summary, um, this person is amazing, and anyone interested in pediatric type 1 diabetes research should follow her. So you can really, really amplify the work of others. And I think, um, you know, this is important for us to do with our colleagues, but also important for our leadership to do for students and junior faculty as well. And then I have, uh, that's my time, and I have room for questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Michelle, for, for um, excellent, excellent content. So I, I do want to encourage you, if you have questions at this time, please use, use the chat area to type in your questions. Um, and over the course of your presentation, we did get some questions. Okay. So one of them is if you could just kind of go over again um, the, the, power, the Twitter size power for the PowerPoint. Um, you had indicated and you had a slide about the specific side that, size that you want to make sure that you have for your PowerPoint so that it doesn't force individuals to go on a second page. Sure, so it's 10.66 inches by 5.33 inches. And I think what's really important too is when you put up a tweet, there's a little sliver of the left-hand side that gets cut off. So try and make sure that you leave some gap on that left-hand side, otherwise it will probably get cut off just a tiny bit. So leaving plenty of white space so that um, you can make sure that, you know, whatever was, was, that nothing important gets cut off. Great, thank you. And um, for the visual uh, abstract, do the nursing journals give you access to their logo or how did that work? So I've never had anyone um, complain about us using uh, their logo, but um, to be honest, I've never used a nursing one specifically. All of mine have been in the diabetes or the technology space. 
if you are concerned about it, I would definitely reach out to the editor and see if there is a concern there. You don't necessarily have to use the logo, but it also promotes them as a journal as well. Um, so again, you could always double check um, because I don't have experience specific with nursing journals when I've done that. Great, thank you. Um, another question that came in is, are there any um, risks or issues to be aware of if the work has been published? Um, are there any you know, special permissions that you need from journals? Anything that you would suggest to make sure you have all your bases covered? That's a great question. So I think that um, making sure that these are bite-sized summaries. Um, journals, you know, journals are in competition with each other these days, and they're really wanting to make sure that they're increasing their impact. And so anytime that you're driving someone to their, their webpage, um, they like that. And so I've never had an issue. I think that there, the one time that there, there could be some issues if you have a press release and, um, for example, this is what happened to me is that I had a press release from a professional organization based on a presentation I gave, but I had also submitted my work to a journal. And once you submit everything, um, you, you, everything that you say is, um, is um, embargoed. And so the timing of these press releases is really, really important. So if you know you're going to a conference and you know that there's going to be a press release, you might delay submitting your manuscript for publication by maybe a month just so that you can do those interviews. And then once you've kind of gone through all of those, then, then you can submit. Um, because again, once you've pushed submit, now you're embargoed and you can't actually talk to the press about it until it's actually published. Okay, great. Um, and there was a follow-up question related to that, um, and it's, are there any copyright issues with a visual abstract? I think you kind of addressed that or, a little bit, um, but if you could just reiterate kind of your response to that. Sure. So I think that it's important to make sure that you're not using somebody else's image. So sometimes, um, you know, some people have the skills to create their own images. Um, there are a lot of free images that you can use, and then there's images you can purchase. And so um, one way to get images is through PowerPoint. Um, Canva and Lucid Press also have a lot of free images as well. Um, and then some people, um, some organizations have um, editing funds, which can be used for graphic support. Um, so depending on your university, you might have access to that, you might not. Um, but I think that there's definitely ways that you can also um, create images if, um, if you have that skill set or maybe somebody that, you're, um, that you know might be able to support you in some of that graphic development as well. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Another question is related to the social media platforms and, of course, with there being so many. Um, do you suggest really focusing on Twitter or, you know, spending some time on Facebook or do others work as well? I think it depends on your goal. So, for me, Twitter is completely professional. It, is, it has nothing to do with my personal life. And Twitter is, is where my you know, my, myself as a, as a nurse practitioner and a nurse scientist, that's where I, that's where I am on Twitter. Um, for other platforms, so Instagram is something that is not public. And for me, it's where I share pictures of my family with my friends and I make sure that it's a private account. And then Facebook, um, I've actually created two accounts. I have one that's uh, more for personal use, and then I have one for professional use. And the reason why I created one for professional use is because I had patients um, trying to reach out to engage with me about different research that they had found or um, different questions that they had. And so I decided to create a professional Facebook page several years ago for that reason. Um, I think people have to decide, do they have the time to maintain several accounts? I do recommend um, keeping your personal and your professional separate. I think that um, I think that it's important that once you your work gets out there, 
um, especially if somebody has anything that could be deemed as potentially controversial. So I know that some of my colleagues in the reproductive justice space um, have had some personal attacks and having your profile not tied too much to some of your personal information can be really, really important. Great, thank you. And um, related to that, for you know, for those who maybe have a little bit of um, fear posting on Twitter and really putting themselves out there, do you have any suggestions to really get um, over kind of those obstacles and barriers? Sure. I think that sometimes, um, especially if you can do that in a small group where uh, maybe there's a few people that are doing initiating their first couple of tweets all at the same time, I think if you can get um, people to like and follow each other, especially in the very beginning, it can be helpful. And also, for those of you who are in, um, in school still, academic chatter and academic Twitter, um, so at hashtag academic chatter and hashtag academic Twitter are really, really great places for students and early faculty to be because they're really um, talking about this experience of being um, the process of new generation of knowledge um, and they're, they're not quite, ex they don't have, a t you know, some have a lot of experience but the majority are really new to this space. And so that's a really great community to, to start out with. And this is a, a multidisciplinary community. It's not just in the health space. It's also you know, in the life sciences. It's kind of across the board. But it's a really nice place for people who are very first starting out. The other thing you could do is check with your university to see if they have a listing of all of the faculty. So I know um, at the University of Utah, our college of nursing has developed a a listing of all of the, the faculty. And then within small student cohort groups, I know that they do share their Twitter handles with each other as well. So I think that that might be another place to start as well. Great, thank you. Um, and do you have any advice on the best way to share a template such as the Twitter PowerPoint that you demonstrated with students? Sure, so my email is right here on this question slide. So if you are interested in having a template, I can share that. Um, I can, I'm happy to share that with you. I think it's just important to make sure that you're, you're making sure your logo goes in for your university. Um, and then also thinking about colors and contrast. Um, you know, some of the slides I showed uh, tended to be more pastel colors and some of them are really that dark, bold red, which is the color of the University of Utah. So I think that you have to think about um, how you're trying to represent your work, but also making sure that it's visually pleasing so that somebody could actually read the content. But yeah, happy to share the content. Great. Um, another question is when you live tweet a session or a presentation, do you need to ask for permission from the presenter or the organization first before doing that? That's a great question. So this is a, a public um, thing, and so some people would be concerned about it. You can ask permission if you want. I have never had anyone not want that or say that they were upset that it was done. In fact, most people are so thankful that somebody spent so much time paying attention to their work that they're really, really thankful. I think one of the things is just making sure that the Twitter handle is correct when you're live tweeting somebody. So um, I've seen where somebody actually pulled in a Twitter handle that it was somebody with the same name, but it wasn't the right person. So just making sure that you're doing your due diligence and making sure that it's actually the right person's Twitter handle. And then as far as professional organizations go, I have only heard of one conference in which there was um, some, some kind of upheaval about live tweeting, but it was very specific to photographs, photographs of slide content, but not the people. So um, that was several, that was probably three or four years ago that that happened. Um, I haven't heard of anything recently, and it's starting to become the norm that people are taking pictures of posters, people are taking pictures of different slides when people are presenting, so that people who are in the Twitter audience who may not necessarily be in the conference um, at, at the conference can actually see uh, what great information is being shared as well. Great. 
Thank you. Um, another question is uh, related to the press releases to news outlets. Mm -hmm. The question asks is, do you create your own press releases? And if so, how do you do it? And then how do you decide who to send it to? So this is a great question. So at the University of Utah, we have a great communications team and all press releases have to be authorized by them. And they typically initiate the press release, so they'll create the initial story, and then they send they they sent it to me to kind of review and make any edits before it went out. And so I actually don't know who who the end receivers of all of these press releases were, um, because they were generated by the communications team either through my university or through the professional organization. I do think that if you are in a university setting, you should. Um, make sure that you know the proper procedures for interacting with the communications team. Um, for some, it might be that you could directly en engage with them, and for others, it might be that certain um, that you have to get permission from maybe someone above you in order for that to get moved forward for press release. But um, I think it's important. I think that um, in general. Um, that in general, maybe women don't ask enough, and in general, nurses don't ask enough. And and I think that what you, that you need to realize is that your work is important and it can make a big impact. And all you have to do is ask. It is possible that they'll say no, and I've actually pitched an idea to someone, and they said, you know, I don't think that it's quite right for right now. Um, and that's okay. Um, I think that just keep trying. I do also think that anything, anytime you can tie your work into something that's really um, important in the news right now. So many of you guys have probably heard about the, the rising cost of insulin and, and knew that that's been an issue. Um, and so that was definitely one of the reasons that, um, that my research really took off. So anytime that you can tie your work directly to something that's a hot topic in the news is more likely to generate a press release. Great. Um, another question is, uh, and what happens when you change your last name after you publish an article? Um, does the question is, do they have to let the publisher know? So that is a great question, and unfortunately, I don't have a great response because I got married before I started publishing. I think that um, I don't know if the if the journal would actually change the name, but you could ask. The other thing that you could do is make sure that your ORCID ID and your Google Scholar profile is up to date so that somebody could actually easily identify you even if you have changed your name. The other thing that I would recommend, just because we, I've interviewed enough um, PhD students in our program to know that make sure that when you, when, you public, when you have your CV, that if your last name is different, that you make some sort of notation somewhere about how your last name used to be X, Y, and Z, and now it's this, so that we can actually find you in the lineup of, of authors. And so, so hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. And uh, we did have the audience chime in there as well, and they um, all have also said the ORCID ID mm -hmm. um, should match. Um, and the journal will most likely not change the name in the article. Great, another question. We still have some time and we have lots of questions coming in. Um, so is there a time frame in which you can disseminate uh, unpublished dissertation research on social media accounts such as Twitter? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So dissertation research, I think um, a lot of people like to share their information. I think one thing that is important is if you're really trying to work on work towards publication, you're, you might want to save your efforts until after it's published because um, a lot of times um, having that publication where someone can go and now cite your work is, is going to be really nice. While people can cite dissertations, it's more often, especially like in a review, that someone would, would cite an actual publication rather than a dissertation. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, did, do you need to receive approval from your university prior to using Twitter? Since um, you may be affiliated with the university or representing the university, are there any policies you should be looking into before making any tweets? Yeah, so this is a great question. Every university has different policies set in place. 
I have never heard of anyone banning the use of Twitter, um, but it is important to put in your bio that the tweets represent your thoughts and not the thoughts of your employer. There have been a couple of, um, in light of COVID-19, there have been a couple of people who have had some reprimanded and they've had some issues related to PPE and their discussions of lack of PPE in at certain hospital settings or in, within certain organizations. And so not necessarily at the university level, but more at a hospital level. Um, you know, I think it's really important just to pay attention to your, your social media policies. And they, typically every organization has them at this point. There's also some really great um, policies embedded within some of our professional organizations, like uh, the American Nurses Association has a really great social media policy as well. I think that the main things about Twitter is making sure that, you know, is this something that my grandma, my child, or my future child, my boss, and my spouse would think is appropriate? Because I think sometimes, um, you know, I've seen completely inappropriate tweets by healthcare providers, and I've seen amazing, really helpful tweets by healthcare providers. And I think it's really important to make sure that, um, that your tweets are a great reflection of you and also, um, you know, who you aspire to be. So making sure that you're sharing content that is not, um, that you're, you're not um, degrading patients in any way or other people in any other in any way, I think is really, really important. I typically um, like to share great things on, on Twitter, but also I think important clinical pearls. Um, if anybody um, follows me, they'll see that I talk a lot about misdiagnosis of type one and type two diabetes. You know, someone has type one diabetes, but they're diagnosed as type two diabetes because I've caught that a lot clinically. And so, um, my tweets come across as passionate, but not um, blaming. And so I think that it's really important to, to make sure that your tweets are a good professional representation of you. Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, another question is related to um, giving your research some attention from the media. Um, I know you talked about, you know, looking at hot topics um, but how do you suggest if perhaps, you know, there's, uh, your research does not relate to something that's currently in the media, how do you suggest getting their attention um, and perhaps, you know, getting more coverage of your research? That's a great question. So um, sometimes there's a way to, um, I think there's different ways to leverage it. So um, even though insulin was a hot topic, the way that the press release read, this was December, um, the way the press release read was, while some people are out shopping for sweaters and jewelry, um, other people are desperately trying to find, find ways to purchase insulin to save their lives. And so I think if you can think about a way to leverage maybe the season, um, leverage something about um, what might be going on, that's really important. I think that if people are more willing to to do a press release on something that's not pilot data, something that um, is a, a, a study that um, really is highlighting something new and not something that is already known. The study that I spoke about throughout the presentation, it was a mixed method study. Um, so we had some really solid qualitative data and some really solid quotes, but also did have some quantitative data as well. So I think um, it's not that qualitative data doesn't get highlighted. I think it's, um, it's just making sure that the story is, is really important and maybe trying to convince the communications team that your story is important is probably gonna be the first step because if you can't convince the communications team that the story is important that stands alone, even though there's not something that's kind of hot topic emerging in, in in the, the public view. Um, I think it's going to be your job to really convince them of that. Great. Um, so thank you so much, Michelle. I don't see any other questions that have come in at this time. Um, lots of folks have uh, sent messages saying this was excellent content, uh, some really game-changing presentation or uh, information that you've provided to everyone. So thank you so much for joining us today.
Um, I just want to remind everyone to please complete the evaluation. I am currently posting the um, evaluation slide as well as a link to the evaluation is available in the chat area. Um, so if you could all please click on that and complete the evaluation. We really appreciate you joining us today. And thank you so much, Michelle, for an excellent presentation. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I, I love being here. And if anybody has any other questions, feel free to um, email me or reach out on Twitter. I'm happy to connect. Thanks so much.